welcome to Healing the Patriarchy with Love podcast. I'm your host, Luna, and together we're becoming rebels of the heart, one show at a time. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me, your host, Luna, on today's show. Today, we have Bernadette Vallely with us. Bernadette is a best-selling author, feminist and eco-activist who has been working actively for social justice for at least 45 years and she's joined us today and I feel incredibly privileged and honoured that she is doing so because she's coming on to talk about a new book that she's written which gives a true history of London from a woman's perspective. I've been, I've just heard a little snippet prior to this, I haven't heard the full thing yet but that alone was enough to make me feel emotional um, I'm really, really honoured that Bernadette's coming on the show to talk about it. If you are somebody that is interested in true history and particularly the history of the goddess, you want to continue listening to this. Bernadette's going to do the majority of the talking because she obviously knows more about the book than I do, being the author. And I'm just going to ask a few questions as we go along, but mostly I'm going to let Bernadette talk about this fascinating and incredible topic and this or just unbelievable book that she's written. So, Bernadette, are you okay to kind of... Oh, thank you very much, Luna Anna, and thank you for inviting me and giving me the space to talk about this. Um, I can't pretend that I knew what I was going to talk about 10 years ago when this project began. But I had an inkling, and I think that there's a lot of people out there that do have an inkling that there was once um, goddess worship in our country. And um, we know about some of the Celtic goddesses like Bridget. Um, but actually, the Roman goddess Diana had an extremely important influence on London and London's history, the foundation of London, the mythology that surrounds it. And up until now, most people have thought, well, there's no evidence to prove that. Let's uh, you know, move right along, nothing to see. Um, but I decided about 10 years ago after a very long um, meditation that lasted, a, a silence and meditation that lasted 90 days, I decided I was going to write a book that explored the actual physical evidence and that satisfied me that there was something there. And I thought it was going to be a booklet, a small pamphlet, so to speak, um, <laughs> that laid out a few objects that you could go and visit. And little did I know, because in that first year of my research, I, I found hundreds of thousands of pieces from, it, mainly because our museums are stuffed with all the things we've taken from other countries. Um, but somewhere in there, there was also a lot of evidence of goddess worship in London. And that's what I really honed in on using the evidence of the goddesses from other countries like Greece, you can see um, how a statue is made, what's on it, the icons around it, the animals, the, the, the symbols, the flowers, that sort of thing. You can tell which goddess it is or, or what the message is from that piece of sculpture or statue or whatever because of what surrounds it. And um, the Greeks and the Romans used that a lot. Um, and in particular, which is the first part of my research that's going to come out, which is really historical research and um, archaeology mixed together, um, there are a number of terra sigillata bowls that were made only for the London market. They knew, historians have known they were made for London, because they all went to London and they filtered out around Britain from this axis of London. Um, so they were clearly sold there. And they had pictures around them. And we know from my studies of other art, which is other Roman art, which includes the little lamps and intaglios, jewelry, um, things you find on sarcophagi, um, mosaics, floors, walls, frescoes, you can tell when something's Roman and you, you can tell when the gods, the deities and the, the goddesses 
um, what they're wearing, what they're holding. You know, you get a, you can get a quick picture. And that's because most people in that era couldn't read. They actually saw things in pictures, like in a way, the way that modern, the modern world has reduced themselves to emojis. Um, there were emojis that said, this is the goddess Diana. And mostly it was when she held a bow and arrow and held a hind. Um, but there are other ones of Diana. And she was also involved in rituals of dancing, especially dancing. And um, there are thousands and thousands of bones that have been found in London that have got all these pictures on, which is significantly, 99% of them relate to Diana and her worship in London. It's an extraordinary revelation because up till this point, because they're tiny fragments and shards of pottery that have been found from 2000 years ago, it's, it, it's been a mammoth task to identify where they were made, who the artist was that made them, the exact shade of red that matches the exact um, place and of significance where they were you know, manufactured. And you've got to understand this was the first main manufactured product in the world at the time. It was the first kind of pottery that was made en masse. So they pressed all these pictures into blobs of red clay and put them out to dry, just like the priestesses did in the Greek times for the uh, troshes that were honouring Artemis, the Diana, Diana's Greek counterpart. So there were all these similarities, and yet these broken bits of pottery had never been really examined as a whole. And I realized that um, they weren't like other Roman art, not at all. In fact, there was only about a hundred images that were used over and over and over again through the 260 years of their production. So these things were made for London, delivered to London, had imagery of the goddess Diana on them. They were found predominantly in London and the Southeast, but also across Britain. And there's tangible physical evidence that backs that up. That's not just the pottery with these pictures of Diana on them and all her animals, but there's other things. There's um, an altar has been found. Um, some brass uh, imagery has been found, a, a, a lamp with a picture of the Temple of Diana um, at St Paul's Cathedral, where St Paul's Cathedral now stands. Oh. Um, and it makes sense because, first of all, there's a lot of rumours that that happened. There's a lot of rumours throughout history that there was a temple to Diana underneath St Paul's Cathedral. And it was more than rumours, because at one point in our history, there was a great big banner inside St Paul's Cathedral. And it, re it reads that the actual wording of which has been written down, I think it was in the 15th century. And it said, where you're standing right now is on top of where used to be a temple to the, the goddess Diana. Um, and, and that was a banner that was like somebody'd sewn you know, and, and it was up high in the rafters at St Paul's Cathedral, in the middle of St Paul's Cathedral. It was like the history. Now you would go in and there'd be, um, you know, boards and an exhibition and some pictures and that sort of thing. Um, this was the equivalent in the 15th, 16th century. It was They told you the history related to that area. Um, of course, they don't tell you that now. But it's a long convoluted story about St Paul's, the nub of which is significant archaeological evidence, uh, has mostly been sold off. But at one point, the man who collected it in the 17th century um, exhibited it at, at Cambridge and set up, he was a zoo archaeologist, and he found 
hundreds and hundreds of deer bones under St Paul's Cathedral. Um, and he was a friend of uh, Sir Christopher Wren, in fact. He found hunt and deer bones and special uh, pateri, which are sort of plates that you do um, when, you, when you cut an animal's neck and you let the blood come out and they, it falls into a bowl. And that bowl, um, which is usually much larger than you would ever see in a house, but that bowl collects the blood and then the priest or priestess would use the blood for a ritual. So these things were found underneath them. And um, in fact, there's a museum now in Cambridge that is dedicated to that man and his find findings. But all the stuff that was found underneath St Paul's was sold off in order to build the building of the Sedgwick uh, Museum, which is very rather sad. And I'm still trying to find out who bought the stuff. But it is listed and we do know that he found significant evidence and he wrote letters about it as well, which has been found. And of course, in a religious sense, this was the, emer the emerging um, world of, of Christianity in its Roman Catholic form, especially at the beginning of the turn of, um, you know, the Christian eruption around Augustus and everyone in the Roman era. And I can pinpoint the end of Christianity, the end of the paganism and the worship of Diana in London and the beginning of Christianity to the end, the significant end of the production of these bowls. That's never been done before. Um, I can also fascinatingly connect the production of these bowls and the pictures on them to lots of unsolved, as yet unsolved mysteries in archeological conundrums because the pictures are like a Bible. They give us really clear imagery of what, what the rituals were, what they did, how they did them, and um, how significant they are in history. There's so many examples, but one example. Oh, just before I finish with St. Paul, St. Paul's letters to the Ephesians in the Bible yeah. All St Paul's teachings are about him going to Ephesus, which was the other great centre of Diana worship um, in the Roman era and before in the Greek era. Um, and it was considered, you know, the Bank of Asia, the centre of the world. Ephesus was a thriving, massive city with this enormous temple to Artemis Diana and worship had been going on to the goddess at that, that place for at least 8,000 years. Um, and all our imagery of that goddess, which some people remember as many breasted, because it looks like she's got breasts in front of her, like three or four rows. Um, but the pottery helps us with that conundrum because uh, archaeologists have been arguing for centuries over whether they're breasts or not because they don't have any nipples. Um, and so, in fact, I can prove beyond a reasonable doubt now that the bowls with the iconography on them actually show testicles, scrota. And the imagery in the, the, the statue of the goddess with all the animals across her and on her arms and on her legs. There's deer, lions, all the wild animals which she represents have also got these three rows of scrota across her front. And there are hundreds of images on the pottery with the same thing with scrota um, and sometimes with the whole penis. And they were honouring it. They weren't honouring it for, for sexual reasons. They were honouring it as a symbol of fertility, of increase, of vigour, of dynamism. And I can only guess that these bowls were used for um, to put the, the scrota of a castrated animal in them and then make an offering to the goddess on behalf of whatever they wanted. The religion in Roman times was a very, um, I'll do this if you do this kind of affair. 
and uh, people would make an offering and say, if you grant me this, I will build a, a temple or make an offering or I will, you know, do whatever they had to do. So there was a huge amount of energy there at St. Paul's Cathedral. And when St. Paul went to Ephesus and argued against Diana, it became like significant go to your bible and read acts 19 the acts of the apostles is all about st paul arguing with the people of ephesus that they shouldn't worship diana and the people are arguing back but diana whom all the world worshipeth so we know at that time period which was 40 a.d and just can counting, St. Paul was traveling the world. Literally, his adversary was Diana. And so when the pagan religions fell, they built Christian churches to St. Paul, where there was a Diana temple. They built um, churches to, um, who's it, Westminster Cathedral. They, they chose a different symbol of Christianity to build on top of all the pagan um, places. And they had to build on top because that's what the other religions did. Because before Diana was at St. Paul's, it was likely the Druids were there. And before the Druids, who knows, you know, what kind of religion or, or spiritual essence of who we were was represented. That was because it was the highest point in Roman London, where the defensive walls all surrounded the city. The highest point within the city was St. Paul's, where St. Paul's Cathedral is now at Ludgate Hill. And I think that was the epicentre of Diana worship in the Western Roman civilization. And Ephesus in the East was the Eastern epicenter of Diana worship. Now, I would not have said that at the beginning of my um, journey on this, but for the first five or six years, I walked around London, literally twice a week, I would go out on actual visits to a museum, to walk around um, an area. I'd go, I'd try and get the vibe of a place. I'd look at records. I've been to, you know, all sorts of libraries and seen microfiches and seen collections. I've been to the Museum of London's collection behind the scenes, um, which is just like you imagine in the movies hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of rows of um, with boring looking boxes filled with treasure. Of course, 99.9% .9 of it is broken pottery, just broken pottery with nothing written on it, nothing to see. And so when you get a piece of um, Samian ware, as it's called in London, or terra sigillata, as it's called around the whole world, um, when you get a small piece with a picture on it, it's like, wow. So what I've done with all these bits from the Museum of London's collection and the British Museum's collection, because of course the British Museum has all the collector's art. So their collection is, is more whole, significantly significant bowls that are like not broken at all, because that's what the collectors all wanted to go for. And over the centuries, their relatives and everything left them or bequeathed them to the museum. So you've got about 25 people's collections there. And there's only 600 from the British Museum, but they're really good ones. And then there's about five and a half thousand from the Museum of London. And so during lockdown, I took it on as a task to look properly. And I started doing lists and I started doing clusters and I, I started to view it. It wasn't till halfway through the process that I realized what I had in front of me. And I can remember when my friend Kate came over, it was during lockdown and um, we were sitting outside and I was trying to say, oh my God, Kate, look at this. There's all these, there's deer everywhere all the way through this pottery. That is significant. That's like a word because people couldn't read. They looked, the deer, 
equaled Diana. The dog equaled Diana. Dogs with collars equal Actian. Actian, of course, is one of the mythological stories about Diana, is that um, he came to the water's edge and he saw Diana bathing with her nymphs. And it was such a beautiful thing that um, he, he couldn't take her, his eyes off her beauty. And there's a, an understanding that something went on, but she was furious when she saw him. And he was basically with his hounds and she set his dogs on her. He, she set his own dogs on him who ate him and he turned into a stag and the, the hounds just tore into pieces. Um, and it was a kind of metaphor on a lot of ways. Some people think that he, he tried to rape her and um, she had her, her revenge because one of her attributes, in fact, is protection of women from rape. Um, she's an amazing goddess. She has so many wild animals, fertility, the beginning of emerging vegetation, the seed sprouting into its first leaf. That's her job. That, that's why the Romans loved her, because of the impulse for vitality, fertility, um, springing from the, the earth up into. And she's the virgin goddess, of course. Um, and as an important virgin goddess, she was responsible for the coming of age rituals. Um, not just in Ephesus, but across the Greek Empire and across the Roman Empire. Most towns, Sparta is a good, Sparta had seven temples to Diana, to Artemis Diana. Um, what they did was they took the children, the virgins, out of the community for about six months. And they made them go through a series of lessons and training. They learned how to be good soldiers. So they learned to fight in a unit, but the fighting was Pyrrhic. You know, nobody won. It wasn't like that. It was a game. It was a dance. And they learned to dance. The Pyrrhic dance was basically a dance where they would use their swords and this beautiful long silk piece of uh, cloth. And the men would all learn to dance together without tearing the cloth and without cutting anyone. Um, and that's how they learnt to be a unit and a formation together when they were out on the battlefield. That was their first soft introduction to um, being um, proper soldiers for the Roman Empire. And the Romans and the Greeks believed that beauty was held in physical athleticism. And so there was a great deal of emphasis placed on boys and girls um, learning to run foot races they called them and so they ran everywhere and um the running in that six month trial or that six month kind of emerging into an adulthood they sculpted their bodies and learned to be healthy and they clearly were getting instruction um, on religion and things like that as well and that's all replicated on these bowls and that's fascinating that actually there's evidence there, physical evidence that, we, that, that the coming of age festival happened in London, as well as Ephesus, as well as the Greek Empire. We've got, we've got a historian called William Camden. Yes, Camden. Um, he's, he's quite well known because in the 1600s, he was the first historian to say that local history is important and that you should notice local history as a, and you shouldn't just write about kings and queens and great battles and you should notice what goes on in a locality. But he, he was prolific, he wrote a lot of work. But he also, when he was a child, saw a ritual to Diana at the steps of St Paul's Cathedral still carrying on after all that time, 1600. And he said they cut, they cut the throat of a deer and they put the head on a pole and they went around the four quarters and horns were sounded throughout London. 
as people recognized it as Horndale, the horns were blown to say that the ritual had begun. And the rest of the deer was cut up into pieces and fried on a big barbecue, which there are remnants there. And the deer bones were held very sacred. And so they were buried in a sacred way, being whole. Down the road from Ludgate Hill at St Paul's, they found um, a restaurant literally down the hill. And that restaurant had a big pit and they opened it up and they found all the animals that everyone ate. And they found that all the bones of all the animals they ate were all cut, smashed up for the marrow. Every bit was used. Nothing was left intact whatsoever. And yet at the top of the hill where there was honoring for Diana, they found intact bones that were exhibited in Cambridge University. And so we know they definitely existed. And the whole thing about intact bones is really, really ancient because all indigenous people have the same ritual. They consider the deer to be at the top of the food chain, the most important member of any woodland or forest area. They consider the stag, especially with the horns, to be uh, really important. And the stag bones were used for um, all sorts of magic and rituals and to ward off evil. Um, so imagery of the stag and the stag bones is, is known throughout the world. Everyone, every indigenous people has done that. They considered that the, the, the stag or the deer, could, you, you couldn't do anything to offend the other deer if you killed a deer. There were taboos around how you dealt with the deer. And they also put the, the animal skin on their bodies and danced. And that's in the pottery as well. And dancing is a big part of it. They believed that dancing uh, sprouted everything. And so in spring, they danced with Diana and under her direction. And um, they followed sort of ancient ways by dancing. Um, I've got a little poem somewhere about, well, it's not a poem. I say a poem. It's actually a, the hymn to Artemis that talks about that. It's so beautiful. The goddess with a bold heart turns every way, destroying the race of wild beasts. And when she's satisfied and has cheered her heart, this huntress, who delights in arrows, slackens her supple bows and goes to the great house of her dear brother, Phoebus Apollo, to the rich land of Delphi and there to order the lovely dance of the muses and the graces. And it was considered in Greek and Roman times that Diana was in charge of all the dances and the 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 Greek um, chorus is basically the dancers and singers learning in their six months, doing their, their stint, if you like, as, as virgins learning under her tutelage. They learned to dance. And there were certain dances for certain things. Most of them were to do with fertility. They would do it at different times of the year, but mostly in spring. Um, and there were all sorts of kind of like cul-de-sacs that have ended up in British culture that we haven't fully explored and appreciated. More things that I can prove. Example, the first maypole and may, may tree dancing is on the pottery. There it is for all to see. The sacred tree transforming into the maypole. There are certain trees on that pottery that look so much like the medieval maypole. It is stunning and probably they, it was a direct copy. That's incredible because people say, oh, where did that come from? And what happens when they don't know where something came from? They say, oh, it's mythology, it's folklore. But actually, if you've got something physical that shows that, you can say that was real. And so I can now say, that that is real. So those 6,000 pictures are like a dictionary 
The first book is going to be long because it's the dictionary of those 6,000 pieces. And I've linked up the mythology of how the Greeks did it or the uh, Ephesians did it in Turkey, what is now Turkey, which is called um, East Asia at the time. Um, and I've linked that mythology and what we know from the pictures and the, the writing and the evidence. And I've shown here in Rome and London, it happened here, the same ritual, the same Torah polia. And William Camden said in 1600, the learned know that the Torah polia took place in London. And that's never properly been explored. I didn't even know what it was talking about. And I've gone all the way back and found it because it's in there, in the pictures. There was a, a proper major centre of goddess worship in London, centred around Ludgate Hill. And um, there's physical pieces that will show everyone. There's no, no more poo-pooing it and saying, oh, no, there's no evidence. If they'd found 6,000 pieces of evidence about any of the other gods, people would be shouting and jumping up and down. But they haven't noticed it yet. They haven't realised there's only 100 images on this pottery. That's incredible. That's mathematically impossible. Unless they were all falling, following the same, the same code, the same icon, saying the same thing, meaning the same thing. Sprouting vegetables, wild animals. The, it's all about the goddess Diana. And I'm fascinated by that. Really, it, it's not what I thought when I started the journey. I thought there'd be a small pamphlet and it would be, you know, nothing much to see. And that's lazy historians in the past have said that. So when I've read a couple of things, I thought, oh, well, there's obviously nothing to see. But then I've realised, oh, hang on, unpick that a minute. Hang on, go, go back a bit further. Look at the actual first reading of this or that. And then there's so many reasons why history gets destroyed. You know, history gets destroyed because a religion comes in. You know, the, the monks came in after the Roman Empire and destroyed all our history by writing it out, crossing bits out that they didn't like. I'm fascinated by the, the hatred the hatred the establishment had against a historian uh, called Sir Geoffrey of Monmouth. And I never read his stuff for years because there was so much vi vitriol against him. And I read, it took seven months in that 10 years, but I read every single piece of history of Britain. I considered it my job. If I was going to say about the history of London, I had to know what I was talking about. I read everything. I was voraciously reading everything and every manuscript. And I started to see the patterns and where the same text had come from and those sorts of things. And between 400 when the Romans left and 1,100, all the history of Britain all said that Brutus began Britain. He was the start of it. Um, and the beginning part of all their histories is very similar. Um, they say King Lucius was the first Christian king in 136 AD. I mean, nobody believed that. And then they found a letter from King Lucius begging the Pope in 136 AD to help him make Britain a, a Christian country. So much has come out because of the internet that proves otherwise. And I realized when I went back, I have done a lot of study in my life on words and phrases. And um, I, I did a big study on 10,000 British women's views on the world, but it was all open-ended. So it was all like their feelings and things, which everyone thought, you're mad, you can't do that. But actually you can. <laughs> There's not that many words. They were, they were all recycling the same hundred words. And once you put them down and see which came up first and did a word bubble and all that, it's like, oh my God, this is what people think. Why didn't we ask them first instead of telling them what they thought? 
it's just subtle differences in the way words are used. So I started noticing in the history and the manuscripts that the very, very beginning parts were clearly copied from the same script. And then I noticed, oh, and then I read the, the Welsh edition of British history, which is called the uh, Ticilio Chronicles, for those that want to know, uh, and the um, Irish edition of the British history, um, which is based on one of the strands of the British history, and then the one from the Vatican, which I read as well. And so I found that there were basically six main scripts. And I, I did a, a search where I put all, all their in each chapter, what, what they mentioned and what they didn't mention and everything. And then I had Geoffrey of Monmouth, which was 1176. And I wasn't going to cover his stuff, but I thought I'd better to see what it says. And I went through chapter by chapter. And do you know, it was exactly the same until it got to a chapter about this guy, Brutus. And then all the bits that link Brutus and Diana because he was inspired by Diana, you see. He, he, wasn't, he wasn't a very nice man. The word brute comes from him. He was a brute. But he was a young boy, and he was told, his father and mother were told that he was going to kill them both. And then his mother died in childbirth. And when he was a teenager, he was out in the forest, and he um, accidentally shot his father killed his father so he was ostracized from the community and he went and he found all these other people that had been ostracized and all these slaves and all these different battles he got into and you know the hero's journey and halfway through his hero's journey with all these ships and going through the Mediterranean he stops on a small island and finds a temple to Diana that had become in disrepair and he creates a, a ritual with a hind, a, a deer, cuts it, lays down on the skin of the deer, which is still a thing they do in Ireland to deer dream, lays down on the skin and he has this dream and he dreams in front of the statue of the goddess and she comes to him and says, Brutus, take all your people and go to an island past Gaul. And there there are giants, slay the giants, and then you and your progeny will be fine. And he says in the dream, if you do that, then I'll build a temple to you and honor you for the rest of my days. You know, it's a hero's journey. And they meet, you know, they either meet the god, the goddess, a fairy, a you know, all our stories are based somewhere along those lines, aren't they? So he gets this inspiration and he knows where he has to go. And he goes past school, lands in Devon, Totnes apparently, and um, swashbuckling him and all his wonderful men that are his aides and, you know, an early version of Arthur or something. They kill all the... the the, the terrible ogres and the giants and free the land of Britain for people to settle there and live happily ever after. And he goes the length and breadth of Britain and comes upon this hill by a river, by another river in what is now called London. And he sets up a temple to Diana on this hill. And this is all our mythology. So I don't know whether this happened or not. I know that later it happened when the Romans got here because it says in all those history books and manuscripts, it says, and the Romans know this as well because they've written about it. So whether Brutus did that or not, there's a mythology that says that that's what happened. And so eventually that mythology, whether it was true or not, became a reality and a temple was built on that very same place. Whether Brutus existed or not, we don't know, but we do know that the fiercest tribe in Britain before the Romans got there were the Trinovantes, one of 17 tribes. And they had their land from the north side of the Thames, 
in central London, um, right up to the Fenlands. That whole area was the Trinovantes. And there's some excellent books that talk about it. The BBC talk about it. Um, there's some brilliant um, examples. And if you go onto the um, British Museum website and look up the Trinovantes, you can see the coins with Diana's picture on them, and with the crescent moon on them. Um, you can see evidence that the Trinovantes, which means New Troy, which is where Brutus is supposed to have come from, um, it all fits together. So there was definitely a tribe there that said they were called New Troy. They definitely worshipped Diana because there's archaeological evidence of such. They were definitely in that geographical area. So the chances are quite high that they worshipped Diana on this particular area. When the Romans got here, Colchester was the capital and they built all their temples to the big gods like Jupiter in Colchester. That was where their first his, um, sort of strategic headquarters was. And I think that the Temple of Diana in London stayed that way because it was, it was already there. It was already institutionalized within the socio-geographic space and it held that space. And that's why it was easy for the Romans to continue it and put it there and have their Torapolia because there was clearly some worship of her going on before the Romans got there. But the Roman worship evidence is incontrovertible. There's nobody going to change my mind now. I've done 10 years of work um, and I can prove that it stimulated evidence of more goddess worship afterwards. For example, the whole thing about the Virgin Mary, that there was a huge cult of the Virgin Mary in the four, from 400 to you know, 1600s, after Diana and in tangent with Diana, people were honoring the Virgin Mary. Virgin, by the way, as well. You know, they did try and change it up. They were replacing one goddess with another um, deified human being. All these things are important because for women, it's about reclaiming the truth of our history and how, who we worshipped. Women were devoted to the goddess. And um, I think that they were absolutely massively in London in a way that hasn't been understood or recognized by history yet. Um, and when my work comes out, it will be really clear, you know, embarrassingly clear because all sorts of people have missed it in one way, but also a revelation because there'll be a lot of aha moments because the revelation of this pictorial story that's on the pottery explains so many things. It means that William Camden was right. It means there was phallic worship in London. It means that um, Roman paganism was adopted into what are now called folklore in British history, in London's history, the Maypole, um, you know, the Lupercalia Festival, I think became the court jester and um, the Morris dancers. And I, th I think I've shown there's pictures. I don't know if you know about the Lupercalia Festival. The Lupercalia Festival was between the 13th and the, and the um, 15th of February every year. It was a fertility festival in Rome. I think it was carried out in London too, because it's on these pictures. So what they did in Rome was they would get a dog and a goat and about five men that would get drunk and they would slay both animals or even more animals sometimes. And they would cut off their testicles uh, with all the sinews and bits and they would hang them to their knees, their arms, their elbows, their waist, and they would, um, go about the hill in a drunken capacity of chaos and thwack any female that came past them. Now, for these three days while they were drunk, all the females presented themselves in front of these madmen and wanted to be thwacked because they wanted to be fertile and have a baby that year. 
um, and they wanted it to be safe and whatever. Um, Christianity came along and was disgusted yeah. with this pudding of scrota and testicles on your on, on your elbows and they um, stopped it and it's now known as Valentine's Day, the festival of love um, on the 14th, the middle day. But it was well known as Lupercalia. And I think a version of Lupercalia happened in London because it's there on the pictures and there's plenty of um, pictures of, of dancers with um, baubles, like baubles hanging from their elbows and their knees and things like that. And there's one that really does look like um, what we would call a court jester and um, a Morris dancer. And I thought that's where it's come from. It was there for hundreds of years in Britain's history. And in fact, there are over hundreds of years, there are historians that have written about the festivals that have come. Um, the thing at St Paul's Cathedral, there are seven historians that have written about that over about 800 years. So that went on for 800 years, the cutting of the, the neck of the deer and the queen paid for it. There's evidence in, in um, William Camden's day that Queen Elizabeth paid for the deer. Um, there's some misinformation gone out about that. That's kind of like a red herring, but I've exposed that and said, no, 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 that's not actually what happened. I've got the, the accounts of Queen Elizabeth I. I read them, somebody had to. <laughs> So I, I've got a massive piece of work that's going to be unloaded on the British, unsuspecting British public. At the, at the moment, I've this Friday and Saturday, I'm going to British Museum and I'm doing tours of the British Museum, showing physical evidence and pieces that link all these stories together and prove what's happened and show how they're dancing and the honouring of Diana and even the name Lan Dian or Lan Dan. Lan means sacred grove. Before 8th century BC, the word Lan meant sacred grove. Then it meant sacred land. Then it meant church of. I wonder who changed that. Um, and now it means land of or church of in modern language. And there's loads, there's hundreds of places across Britain called Lan, L-L-A-N, the Welsh word Lan. And then Dian, D-I-A-N, that's the shortened version of Diana, and that appears on British coins, spelt D-A-I-N, and so it's Lan Dian, Land of Diana, or Church of Diana, or Sacred Grove of Diana, and that's what London was, um, and it's true. All those people that speculated, they speculated because it wasn't just a rumour, it's actually true, and I can physically prove it, which is very exciting. It's extraordinary. Um, I've got to say, your research and your knowledge is phenomenal. It, I'm just totally blown away. I'm actually honestly blown away. I was thinking, I don't even know what to ask because I just can barely take it, take it in. I know. Um, I'm sorry. I'm overly excited because I spent 10 years only. I, I've told a small number of friends Judith and Kate and a few people, and I've probably bored them to death already. I say, look at this, look at this picture, look at that, what does that mean? Oh my God, guess what I found? Uh, I have been overly excited for years thinking this has got to come out. And now I've, I've finished my draft. There's sensitivity readers reading it. There's an illustrator illustrating it. The pictures are chosen. Um, you know, it's coming towards the end of, uh, you know, of me cooking it and it's going to be put out into the world while I do the next project you know of course mm -hmm. but I think somehow I, I think it's my destiny to write this this history book I can see things and I have been able to see things that have astonished yeah. me and and I am quite shocked that nobody's seen it yet and so I thought well if I can see it then it's my job isn't yeah. it yeah it is indeed I think you know you've obviously got a gift for kind of noticing patterns and and observing things in a, maybe a different way or, or just with mm. slightly more vision than other people and you've been given that gift for a reason and and it 
it feels to me like this is at least one of those reasons is this project and this book which I cannot wait for it to come out I'm, I'm excited <laughs> thank I'm you excited. thank you thank you oh, yeah thank you it's part of putting the truth back in I, I didn't finish telling you about Sir Geoffrey of Monmouth. Can I tell you the, the end of that? Because it is the truth. So imagine all this history from 400 AD to 1176. And it's all similar and it follows a similar trajectory. But when it gets to the story of Brutus and what happens, it slightly veers off. Some of them have a bit more of a story, including the bit where his dad gets shot um, in, in, the, in the forest. Some of them have a bit less, and some of them you can tell it's edited. So there's mm. one of those, I think it's the Irish one, and it's just edited enough that I thought, hang on a minute. And then I read Sir Geoffrey of Monmouth, and I saw the same story all the way through until it gets to the point where he gets to the island and does a prayer to the goddess Diana. That's the first bit that's cut. It's exactly the same all the way through until it gets to that bit and it's cut. And I thought, well, hang on a minute. And then the next bit that's cut is another goddess in chapter two. And I thought, hang on a minute. The monks <laughs> have gone through and cut out all the goddess bits. Well, what a surprise. How dare they? How, well, <laughs> what a surprise, you know. And then, so Geoffrey of Monmouth gets from his Welsh friend, the Bishop of Oxford, he says to the Bishop of Oxford, I think I want to write a history book about Britain. And the Bishop of Oxford says, no, I have a very sacred book. I want you to see it. This is the real true history of Britain. And he gives him this book and Geoffrey of Monmouth translates it into Latin. And so the Latin translation came out in 1176 and was the history of Britain written by Sir Geoffrey of Monmouth in Latin, which was a bigger language at the time than Welsh. It was in Welsh at that time. It got, it, it got changed into Latin and everyone went mental. And he started getting discredited because of that. And if you read in Wikile Wikipedia and all of those, there's a lot of disparaging, oh, it's this, oh, it's made up, because the second half of that book is about the stories and adventures of King Arthur. And nobody knows whether that was true or not. But actually, I think history's coming down to the truth of that now. I think history's turning and saying, yeah, yeah. Even the triads, the, the Welsh triads, talk about King Arthur's son, uh, King Arthur's father. Mm. Um, you know, there's a lot more that meets the eye. And in the same with those rituals at St Paul's Cathedral. They were there. You just have to find the eyewitness accounts from historians that say, oh, the, the, there's, there's one that says the vicars at St Paul's were upset. They were scared that the pagan mob might destroy them. So they had to let the ritual go ahead twice a year for the Diana with the deer. It carried on for hundreds of years. Another horn ritual that carried on for hundreds of years con connected with fertility was the horn fair at Charlton, SE7. That went on till the 18th century. And then nobody knows where it came from, but it was everyone dressed up as deer, put horns on their head, and um, went about frolicking, getting drunk and having licentious sex with everyone they wanted. And it was women's choice. For three full days, women could choose who they wanted to sleep with. And there were no repercussions on their husbands or anything. <laughs> Charlton. <laughs> Charlton SC7. It's there. Oh, they have reinstated it, but it's more of a a social, cultural, historical event where people dress up and go on procession. And they went on procession from um, Rotherhithe all the way um, over to up Greenwich Park, through Greenwich Park, where the, the Roman temple to Diana was. And then along, just along half a mile down the road on the top of the hill to um, Horn Fair Park, it's now called. 
with reference to the history of it. Yeah. Um, okay. People thought that was a medieval affair. No, it was it was Roman. It was before that. That's how it's so strong and came about. So there's all these bits and places in London's history. And of course, London now is full of Diana. Isn't it interesting how you cannot suppress what needs to be somewhere? You cannot suppress the goddess. There, yeah, yeah. London was the central place of Diana worship, we know for certain in Roman times. Now I can tell you that Rome, um, that modern London is full of Diana. All the great parks have beautiful statues to her. Hyde Park, Green Park, um, Bushy Park, Greenwich Park. Um, Bushy Park has one of the most famous uh, valuable statues in our country. Gold in the middle of, it's called the Diana Fountain. And there she stands and the birds will come and fly around her. Um, and there's a moat with water and then all the cars go round and it, all roads in Bushy Park lead to Diana. And there it is, the deer and it's dog walking. It's the biggest deer park in London. Beautiful, beautiful park. And then a, a park like Green Park um, has a statue to Diana and nearby 13 trees in a circle. A perfect witch's coven. And somebody who planted those trees knew what they were doing for certain. Greenwich Park, of course, has the Roman temple to Diana on um, Temple Road, if you want to go and see it. Um, it's not much to look at, but you could feel the vibration. They found an arm of Diana um, there. And of course, it has fantastic views of London from Greenwich Park because it's at the top of the hill looking down along the river. And the Romans would have used it as a sentry point and a, as a, a looking point for sure. People, any ships coming sailing up the river, they would be able to catch them before they got to central London where it was barricaded. The other hill in central London is there right at the beginning of the, the old Roman walls, um, which is the White Tower, but that's man-made. The Romans made that themselves. So it's, it's Ludgate Hill within Roman London that was the, the place to be. Um, and St Paul's Cathedral basically just usurped her. It's pretty clear, pretty, a lot of evidence for that. So mm. I've got one question, which <clears throat> might be slightly off, off topic, but I, what just kept occurring to me is, were there other goddesses as well, or was Diana the, oh, yes. the primary one or the only one? But she was the primary, most certainly, especially for London, I think. Yeah. You can tell with the preponderance where the bowls are found and what's happened. But so we, our history and our, it's all linked up with goddesses, even when we don't realise it. Um, Athena is a good example. The Greek goddess Athena, the goddess of war and strategy of war. Um, she's a protectress goddess, in fact, not a, not a fighter. Um, she kind of strategizes and protects. And she was the protectress of Athens, Athena, the name. And she was the goddess of Athens. And when the British under Lord Elgin came and took the Elgin marbles, he took parts of Athena's temple to London in the 18th century. And he put them all up and that's what the, the, the Elgin marbles and all the arguments about the Parthenon and everything are all about. That nobody really says, actually, that's a part of the temple to Athena. And we took it and put it up. And actually what we did was we built a temple to Athena in London. <laughs> and Athena and the Greek equivalent, which is Minerva, <laughs> it's the same thing with the owl, with the cleverness, with wisdom, with... Um, uh, all sorts of arts and culture, science and um, machinery and things like that are all under her wings, so to speak. Um, and then Bridget is the goddess of our land in Britain. Yeah. yeah. Kel Celtic Bridget. Um, I think those three goddesses merged in the Roman era and became what we call Britannia. Oh, yeah. Okay. Britannia with the same headgear as Minerva 
and um, as Athena, Britannia with the, the sword uh, and the um, shield, Athena and Minerva had the shield with the Gorgon's head, with Medusa's head on it as a talisman, but British Britannia has the flag of Britain on it. Um, and there she is looking everything the part as if she is um, the personification of the land of Britain with Bridget, the Athena Minerva link. And she has been in our culture for thousands of years since, 2000 years, obviously, coins, the back of all our coins up until literally 20 years ago, always had Britannia on them. If you go to London in the Bank of England, the first goddess you'll find at the front door is this great statue of um, Britannia. If you look at um, up in London to buildings, on top of the buildings, hundreds of them have a statue of Britannia. Go outside of Waterloo Station, look behind you and there's Britannia. Um, Britannia House, Britannia. Um, all sorts of government buildings and buildings that define London and its stature as a world-class city um, have been blessed or protected or have a picture or um, an image or a sculpture, a statue of Britannia somewhere. So there's hundreds, not just a few, hundreds. So you can walk around London with your head up to the sky and you'll see the goddess there and how she's influenced our history. Um, whether she was honored in the same way as Diana at the time, Athena is not known, um, doubtful, because this pottery for, for Diana is, is vast evidence. So there's one example. However, I have to balance that with the truth about Britannia is she was the mascot for some of the worst, darkest, most racist, biased uh, times in British history when we thought we were invincible and our, our um, forefathers and mothers before us went on boats and ships and took slaves and murdered people and claimed land that wasn't theirs and stole left, right and centre and destroyed cultures and people around them without thought and as uh, in an act of evil. And they used Britannia as their mascot the beginnings of the fronts of boats and as a flag and things like that. And rule Britannia, Britannia rules the waves. Britons never shall be slaves. That was all the gung-ho part of the honoring of Britannia that I don't think for a minute that the goddess um, Athena, Minerva and Bridget would have agreed with or sanctioned or understood or, or, or been part of if they'd wanted in any way. So our history is complicated, for sure, for certain. But probably every person in Britain up until the last 10 or 20 years that held coin would have held a picture of Britannia in their hand. They would have seen her unconsciously, re repeatedly. It's a good example because she's everywhere. But Diana's mm -hmm. everywhere, just in different ways. She's in the museums, she's in the parks, she's there. Just as soon as you open your eyes to it, you think, wow, actually, look at that, look at that. Look at our history being missed and misunderstood just slightly enough to cause, you know, historical problems later on and mean that women's history eventually gets erased, doesn't it? And gets meaningless, which is very unfair. Oh, I tell you, I'll tell you something interesting that might fascinate you. Um, Anna Strymer. Anna Strymer is the magic of skirt lifting. So it's always been a mythology that there was this magic that was used that was skirt lifting. We've never seen a real picture of it before. And it's when a goddess lifts the folds of her dress and shows her flower, her cunt, her yoni to the world and it is so visceral and frightening that grown men who are like even in the army are frightened and so there's Roman stories about this being a thing and I found three images of it on the pottery 
And that's the first imagery in Roman civilization with Anna Schreimer on it, the magic of skirt lifting. Um, and there is actually one more image, but the people that have it didn't realize until recently. So I've written it up and hopefully they'll, they'll change their, their piece. They don't realize that they've got a piece with this in it yet on a, on a lamp, for a Roman lamp in a university in America. <laughs> And oh, that's that fascinating, is. isn't it? It's like, oh, they yeah. believed that. Have you ever yeah. heard of the magic of skirt lifting? I didn't know how to proper name, but I've heard of it before, yes. Warding um, off evil by the power yeah. of the genitalia. Yeah. That's a fascinating part of it. Um, I wonder if that would still work today with all the way that women are... <laughs> Gosh, who knows? Who knows? <laughs> yeah. Who knows indeed? Oh, the origin of the Easter bunny. Would you like to know that, yes. that story? That's yes. amazing. So on the pottery, there are lots of images that are testes or scrota. Yeah. And it's quite clear to me that that was part of the religious act because there are hundreds of pictures where they would have animals beside um, like a deer or a lioness or and then in the middle, they would have a particular way of drawing what I call a phallic altar. Four rosettes in the corners, zagged lines that, that denote energy or life force. And then uh, and in a drawn in exactly the same way over hundreds of years. So we know that they replicated the same picture. And then in the middle, in the little triangle in the middle, there are scrota or penises or the whole thing. And it was obvious that they thought that they were sacred. And um, there are lots of pictures of hairs, the animal, the hair. The hair was sacred to Diana and Artemis. It was a symbol of fertility um, because of its powerful fertility. Um, it, it, you know, hairs huge animals and very differently observed in Roman and Celtic um, um, mythology and social interactions. So the, the, the Celts believed that you shouldn't kill or eat a hare and that killing a hare was akin to killing your own grandmother and that hares were sacred animals that were to be played with and to become friends of humans in the same way that dogs developed. So the Celts had one particular way that they would deal with hares. The Romans killed them and ate them all the time. Wild animals, part of the wild animals of Diana that everyone killed and ate and loved. Um, so it was a different thing there for sure. So on the pottery, there's the hare and underneath it are four or five scrota in exactly the same way looking in exactly the same way as they have with the deer with the, the the lion and the lioness and the different animals so you can tell it's the same picture it's not accidental but then and I remember reading this when I started reading about the goddess I read um the the, the Christian historian Bede, or the venerable Bede as he's called or known now he wrote history in about what was it, six or 700 AD? And it was British. He wrote the Ecclesiastical History of Britain. And in there, he talks about a goddess called Oestra, the mm. goddess of uh, fertility. Mm. And the first imagery of the hair and Easter eggs, what we call Easter eggs, came about around this time. Christians weren't using this before and the hair and the egg well I can't find that anywhere in pre-Christian ritual or iconography at all um, and the Christian church adopted this and I couldn't find anything and I went methodically this time because I had time to look at it I couldn't find anything about any goddess in the Greek pantheon called the goddess Oestra the first time she's mentioned in history is Bede. Why is that? 
because in actual fact, these were scrotum under the hair, not eggs. There's no such goddess. He led us up a little red herring because he was embarrassed to say that they were scrotum and there were men's testicles or male hair's testicles being honoured in the Roman way. And there's too many pictures now in this Roman pottery. That's what it is. And I think that's an example of the subterfuge that Bede used. One man changed history by saying that. First of all, there's no such goddess, even though it sounds like a Greek word, so you would think it would be. Can't find any evidence of it. And there are hundreds of Greek goddesses named. You think they would leave that one out? Really? No, of course not. Um, secondly, he was embarrassed about the fact that it was testicles. And think of not just the lies of the church around that that started, but past that to every single industry that does bunny rabbit hair and fertility egg symbolism i mean it's a massive thing it's a massive market and it's based on an untrue so my son says i've ruined easter um, <laughs> which is hilarious but it, they're not easter eggs it's not about eggs the eggs eggs in roman iconography are, are shown in a completely different way the ovolo is the egg the sacred egg and it's at the top of temples and it's found on iconography in Greek and Roman times elsewhere. And it represents only a couple of goddesses of which the main one and the one that you see repeatedly is Diana. So we know what we know what the sacred egg looks like for the Roman Empire. Uh, and that's not it. That's the sacred scrota. So hairs and scrota from now on, if you have a <laughs> Easter's Happy coming Easter. up. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'd heard about that, um, you know, that supposed goddess. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that's that. I've learned something there. Wow, thank you. Yeah, yeah. That'll all come out in the wash. <laughs> I like this washing that you're doing. It's <laughs> Yeah, it's washing, isn't it? It's unveiling. I, did, I didn't set about to do that. I had no idea that would all come up. But I'm pleasantly surprised and pleased that I'm able to contribute from research, from actual first, um, you know, real research there um, that hasn't been explored before, I can actually answer some of the questions like, hang on a minute, where did Bede get that idea from? Oh, well, I'm I so mean, grateful. So, so oh. grateful that you've done that research and to such a level and for what you've unveiled and how it's gonna change, I feel you know, how women view history in particular. Well, everyone, but, you know, for women, of course, it's very important yeah. that we remember that, you know, the feminine is also divine. Yeah. Yes. And I think it's a because, good example. Yeah, because goddess has been, you know, cut out of history. As, literally. As a, yeah, yeah, quite literally, as you're, as you're demonstrating. Um, I find, you know, certainly for me as a young girl, because I used to have to go to Roman Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. um, Indoctrination. I did too. I'm yeah. called Bernadette. Yeah, yeah. And, it, you know, there was no mention of the feminine as anything divine at all. But there was lots of examples of men that were divine. Mm. Except I, the Virgin Mary that you could aspire to. She was virginal, pure. She had so much going for her because she was virginal and pure. <laughs> you know, it was all based around, you know, capturing her sexuality, wasn't it? It was all based yeah. around making sure that it was all pure and clean for everyone. And then, you know, she got pregnant. Yeah. Those stories in the Greek tragedies are based at festivals like the Toropolia Festival are all about the prettiest, most loveliest girl in the dance troupe, dancing for Diana, and the most loveliest or the cleverest or the best voice, the one with the best voice, would be captured. Um, Helen of Troy, classic mm -hmm. you know, example, but they would capture the beautiful princess or the maiden, and they would um, gang rape her or rape her or and take her away somewhere and defile her 
um, her past. So she'd be useless from then on. She wouldn't be able to marry well or um, have what she needed in society. Um, and sometimes an older man would come along and rescue her like a paternalistic type and that would bring up the baby that was the inevitable result of the tryst, um, of the rape. And sometimes the baby would go on to be a hero. You know, there are a lot of heroes in the Greek and Roman pantheon that are all based on out of the product of rape. Um, not least Diana herself, Diana and Apollo, the product of rape by Zeus. Um, rape is a, it was a core, unfortunate, horrible story for the, um, you know, that era. They were trying to, by the stories and, and, and the plays and the festivals, they tried to say to the girls, look, this is gonna happen to the, the best of you. The nicest one is gonna, is gonna be taken away by some army or by some, you know, this is your lot, so to speak. And I don't believe that's true, it needs to be true. Um, but Diana took revenge, you see, the goddess took revenge on those that, that tried to upset her, her nymphs. And if they sneaked off and had sex, then she took revenge on them as well. But the gods, just like all the men with their testosterone, I don't know why, but the stories are filled with the gods raping the nicest women. It's just awful. I don't know how we can get over that, but at least the Christian god came along, Mr. Paternalistic, and all the deep feminine stuff went and was held up in the symbolism of Mary being a pure virgin child, almost 12 years old, getting made pregnant by an angel, who is the personification really of victory, the goddess victory there, just like the Romans had. And there's the angel, um, how did she get pregnant? And she's 12 years old. And then an older man comes and rescues her, Joseph, and marries her so that her stain is not, is not seen by everyone. And the son is a hero grows up to save the world, you know, as in Jesus. Mm. That happened with Hercules, that happened with Perseus, that happened with so many um, of the early heroes that came out of, out of their mothers, the product of rape. It's a distressing and yet somehow eventually the stories will come out right in the end as well, as the hero gets vengeance or the hero learns to overcome the stigma or you know those sorts of things happen in the mythologies what can we do about it yeah i know but i think you know your uncovering is a start i feel of yes you know the true stories that you know from what you're saying from what you've seen it felt it feels more equal to me um yes. compared to you know like I say, the objectification of women and this idea that they have to be pure and that then, but then yes. that purity is a threat. So Virtue. They then have to be yeah, yeah. Virtue. Yeah. So that was a big word, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Women had to be virtuous. Virtuous, that's right. Yeah. It's quite sad, isn't it? Yeah. So yeah. the history is there. The evidence is now there and revealed. It's been there all along. It's the time to say, actually, come on, guys, look at this. There's so much evidence, though. I've written about 138,000 words just on the pottery. Really? Gosh, really? Just, and that's the evidence, is it, that you've written about? Yeah, I can't do it any smaller because it's evidence. I have to put the, mm. the evidence. If I don't put all the evidence in, how are yeah. people going to know? Yeah. Um, I can write shorter books and do videos and all sorts of things afterwards, but the evidence has to be laid down for, you know, for all to see. Yeah, and it feels like it's a new history book that you've birthed. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, even right till the end, I, I, didn't, I, I, I couldn't even dream of how amazing these this revelations are. I yeah. honestly, I followed the evidence rather than I've I've seen lots of books about London's history that are 
I think I'm quite a practical person. I do like to see, is there is a, a bowl? Is there a, a picture? Is there a, a statue that everyone can go and worship? There is actually in London. So there are only seven statues from that time period that have survived, statues of Diana. Um, and there's one of them that's in the Sir John Soane Museum in central London, EC1. It's a free museum to get in. And um, it's in the Roman collection. It's a house that's higgledy piggledy, quite a big house in Fetter Lane, but it's a house and it's um, stuffed with all this Roman um, wall pieces and all sorts. And right there in the middle of the stairs is a statue of the goddess Diana with all the animals all over her and with these bulbous protuberances on the front of her chest. And she's a black woman. And um, she's a black woman, she's got black feet, black hands, black face, and these protuberances are white. Um, and it's pretty clear that what's happened is um, they were the testes that were strung up from the animals that they'd uh, richly slaughtered. And they strung up the testes on front of her body. Um, and that's, what it, that's where it came from. It's amazing. And you can go and see it for yourself in central London for free. There's only seven. That one has been repaired, but um, you can look them all up online. Look up the goddess Diana. And as soon as you see a statue with all these animals all over her body, the goddess of wild animals, the Pontia Theorum, as she was called, it's a really important relationship that all humans have to have. With the wildness, isn't it? The wild places, the sacred groves, the places that are quiet and strange and scary and have wildness that is not yours. And that she was the kind of, she's the matron of all of that. Mm. Wow. An extraordinary person. And she was also the goddess of everything that, that wasn't. So all the others, slaves, women, children, virgins, uh, all the weird people, artists even, you know, her and her brother between them, they captured everyone that wasn't, everyone that could be disparaged or despaired or separated or could be the butt of somebody's, you know, jokes or wrath. You know, it's very interesting that she's the kind of goddess of the downtrodden. And she does not like rapists. She does not like them at all. So if you want to get on her good side at the dark moon at midnight, you can uh, call her and tell her about any rapists that you know, and she will she will haunt them. Oh God! I know. So know. says the mythology. <laughs> so says the mythology. Yeah. Um, yeah, she's an extraordinary goddess of the dark moon. Yeah. And London's history will be all the better for the truth coming out at last, I think. Yeah, it absolutely will. So mm. I think we're coming to the end of our call now. Um, mm. But I really want to say, Bernadette, thank you, not just for what you've done and what you're doing and what the book I Sense is going to do, which I feel is massive. But thank you also for your time today and coming and talking to us. I've loved it and I've learned so much, even in this short time that we've had together. And I can't wait for your book to come out. So do you want to just tell people where they can kind of find you if they want the book? Or... Well, you can write to me and I don't know exactly when, because, because who knows? Um, so it will come out in the future and maybe you can give people my email if they're interested and I, I'll start a list I have a list I think um, and I'm doing talks in the British Museum uh, I'll take you around and show you statues and things like that if you're interested uh, I do that every couple of months um, and yeah watch this space somebody will realize not just yourself other people you know and it'll, it'll be out there when it's ready and the stories will be revealed um and uh easter will never be the same again <laughs> it certainly won't <laughs> well, Valentine. thank you so much luna anna for what you're doing and giving people this space and the opportunity and you know centering yourself 
around a really good idea. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, honestly, it's my honour to be able to do it, especially when I have people like you come on. So thank you. So I'm just going to close close the call down now. But thank you so much, Bernadette. I've loved it and I've learned so, so much. And I am so excited for the future because of your book. So thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. And thank you to all the listeners. Goodbye. You've been listening to the Healing the Patriarchy with Love podcast with Luna Anna. Subscribe and follow to join the tribe of Rebel Hearts.